From Jakarta, this is On The Level. I'm Jeff Hutton. This week, life in China is returning to normal. Restaurants are buzzing. Airlines are offering steep discounts to lure back passengers. China's Communist Party has said it would convene its annual National People's Congress by the end of May. But China is lashing out at its critics. Australia is calling for an inquiry into the origins of the pandemic. In response, China's ambassador to Australia, Chang Jingyi, has threatened a consumer boycott of Australian products. In March, China expelled 13 U.S. journalists reporting for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Some businesses and even private citizens are increasingly hostile to foreign nationals. Last month, dozens of black African expatriates in Guangzhou were evicted from their homes. Foreign-owned restaurants are being forced to close. We welcome back Mike Smith, Shanghai correspondent for the Australian Financial Review to talk about the xenophobia that is gripping China. He said that people are increasingly afraid to talk with him for fear of official reprisal. Sometimes canceling interviews or calling him in a panic only hours later, asking, even begging to be dropped from his stories. Diplomatically and politically, things are really tense here. Um, so there's obviously the the huge dispute between China and Donald Trump at the moment and US-American uh, relations are very much in the doghouse. But now Australia's waded in and the Australian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister last week back to global inquiry into the origins of coronavirus. So this has deeply angered China. And then, after nearly two months of lockdown, is there reason for optimism in Indonesia's capital? Data captured from mobile phones, hospital admissions, and testing results all suggest that the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 is spreading at a slower rate. Non-essential businesses have been closed in Jakarta for nearly two months. Late last month, the government of President Joko Widodo suspended all flights and train services from the capital. Anyone leaving the city by car needs a health check and a good reason to leave. Reunification with family is not one of them. But as with other big countries with big mobile populations, success in one locality can be quickly undermined by outbreaks somewhere else. Infections in West Java, home to Jakarta's biggest satellite towns, has seen infections double since mid-April. University of Indonesia epidemiologist Pandu Riono told us the lockdown measures need to stay. We cannot leave the research in Jakarta if the another area surrounding Jakarta still problem with the increasing cases. Stay with us. On the surface, life is almost back to normal in China. If you have friends in China, as I do, their social media posts of ketchups and restaurants, seemingly without social distancing, invoke a bit of envy for those of us still cooped up inside. Spare a thought, though, for the foreigners living there. Nigerians and other Black Africans are being summarily evicted from their homes. Some foreign-owned restaurants are being forced to close. Foreign journalists and their contacts are being harassed by officials. Mike Smith, the Australian Financial Review's correspondent in Shanghai, joined us to discuss the heightened sense of anxiety, even as parents send kids back to school and attempt to pick up their lives where they left off. I began by asking him whether he was enjoying his newfound freedom. And I came out of home quarantine and the China had changed. And the surreal thing was that it was sort of getting back to normal. and. And um, as of now, uh, you walk out here on the street and it feels like it's completely normal, like there was never a pandemic. So it's sort of springtime here. The weather's nice. Everyone is out in the streets. There's lots of traffic. All the shops are open. The restaurants are packed. The bars are busy. Uh, people are back at work. And it feels like life before this thing all hit us. Everyone still wears masks. And there's a bit of, you know, there's a bit of underlying tension people are quite concerned there could be a second outbreak so people are more cautious than before but if you're just walking down the street and 
downtown Shanghai, you wouldn't know. So um, it's great fun. I mean, I'm, you know, going out on Friday, Saturday nights to dinner with friends and all my other friends around the world are stuck, stuck at home. <laughs> yeah, including this one. What I wouldn't give to order something from a from a live waiter and not from not from an app. But uh, there are people who have it far far worse, to be sure. Um, it, it, China has has changed. You said um, me, meaning that li- living conditions have improved, but certainly not attitudes toward foreigners. So can you can you walk us through the uh, specific spat? That China is having with with Australia. Yes, I should I should clarify. I mean, I say China's back to normal on the surface, but but it actually isn't, and and there's going to be a lot of economic challenges here too. But um, diplomatically and politically, things are really tense here. Um, so there's obviously the the huge dispute between China and Donald Trump at the moment, and U.S. Uh, American relations are very much in the doghouse, but now Australia's waded in and the Australian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister last week backed a global inquiry into the origins of coronavirus. So this has deeply angered China. Um, This week, the Chinese ambassador in Canberra gave an interview to my paper, the the Australian Financial Review, and he he put out the, the possible threat of economic retaliation. He was sort of saying that um, this could upset Chinese consumers and they might stop buying Australian beef and dairy and Chinese tourists might stop coming to Australia. So this is sort of China's indirect way of sort of making a bit of a threat to Australia. So relations are very sour. And um, today the People's Daily, which, as you probably know, is the main sort of Communist Party mouthpiece here, um, published a very... A uh, strongly worded article directly criticising the Australian Prime Minister and saying he was using uh, China as a way to blame, uh, or he was trying to blame China for his own failings managing the coronavirus outbreak in Australia and the way he handled the bushfires back in January. So this is very mm. strong criticism from China. So now the business community here is a little bit worried there. There could be some pushback. Um, there's also a general kind of anti-foreigner sentiment happening here in China. So over the last month, China sort of got its domestic cases almost down to zero, but there was a huge influx in new infections from people traveling back into China. Um, some of those people were foreigners. A lot of expats are returning here after leaving, leaving in January, but most of them are actually Chinese citizens and a lot of Chinese students sort of fleeing Europe and the United States. But sort of the state media and the the propaganda here sort of paints this picture of foreigners of being sort of potential carriers of the virus so it's not unusual to walk down the street and particularly an older person will kind of swerve out of your way because they they think you're a bit of a threat so they don't want to go near you i noticed you you wrote wrote an opinion piece that that highlighted some of the added difficulties now you're you're facing trying to do your job uh, you were going out to a, a school i think and you were just trying to get some comments about how light, how nice it is to be you know sort of back to school and back to some sense of normalcy you want to you want to walk us through that what what happened there yeah yeah so there's so much sensitivity now around um around the way the the outbreak is, is being reported overseas. So the authorities in China are sort of even more hypersensitive towards foreign journalists than usual. So yesterday I went out to do a perfectly innocent story on schools reopening in China. So a lot of the schools reopened here yesterday and we went to a high school and uh, hung around outside the front gates when the parents were arriving to pick up the kids and we chatted to some parents there and the parents were really positive they were just saying you know they're, they're happy their kids are back at school and they, they think their children are safe because the schools have introduced sort of all these really strict measures sanitation measures and all the kids have their temperature checked and there's social distancing and all that um, and all their comments were sort of really positive um, and we sort of finished up talking to them but before we left this sort of man approached us with a security guard flanking him and he said he was from the school and wanted to know who we were and we told him and then they said we had to leave immediately 
So that was fine. We left. But then last night, one of the parents uh, messaged us in a complete panic. Um, earlier, she'd been very friendly, very happy to talk, and she was freaking out. She said we couldn't use her comments, couldn't use her photo. Um, she was very, very concerned, and we really got the impression she'd been threatened by the school or someone else uh, for, for talking to us. So this is, I mean, this is sort of a really innocent good news story, and um, the authorities are just really clamping down on their own citizens. They don't want anyone in China talking to the foreign media, no matter what they're saying. I think um, a couple of weeks ago, you you wrote a piece about um, uh, what life was like during the lockdown in, in Wuhan. Um, and uh, you had some trouble finding people to comment from that, too. Was, was, that a, was that a function of you being a foreigner or was that just a function of people being afraid of the, the, the government um, not wanting to, to upset officials at and they wouldn't speak to any reporter any anywhere that wasn't with the the communist party i mean what what what, what do you think of that yeah i mean I, I think you've worked in china so you know the challenges here uh it is often very hard to get people to speak to you um the government put a lot of obstacles in your way and and we weren't physically in wuhan which was also challenging but um but we did get hold of a lot of people in wuhan who had some very sad stories to tell about um, you know, their parents dying in the outbreak and, and the chaotic scenes at the hospitals and how it was all managed. Um, but it was quite interesting. We, we did contact uh, some medical staff at a big hospital and they were initially very keen to talk and I think they had some very um, critical stories to tell of how it was all managed. And then suddenly they pulled out of the interview. Uh, they seemed very, very worried and they'd been told that they weren't allowed to talk to foreign media. And then we we got hold of a memo from a major hospital telling all its staff, there would have been thousands of staff working there that they couldn't talk to foreign media. So this is sort of another example of uh, China wanting to sort of maybe cover up the true story of what happened in Wuhan and, and sort of being hypersensitive to, to foreign media reporting on what's happening in China because they sort of um, assume we're going to write something uh, very, very critical. If, um of course, actually, that's kind of true, though, isn't it? We have been writing some fairly critical stuff about them, um, right. deserved or not. I'm sure, I'm sure it's deserved, but they, I mean, their handling of it um, hasn't been great, and that hasn't been um, reflected very well. I, do you think that maybe the politicians are are bungling this somehow? Uh, I mean, Maurice Payne, the foreign minister, has called for. WHO inquiring into the into into uh, China's um, handling of of the uh, of the virus. Um, do, do you think that was necessary, really, at this point? Uh, isn't it? Shouldn't they be trying to make overtures to China rather than trying to box them in and make them more defensive? Yeah, there's sort of two schools of thought because um, um, uh, look, there's no doubt. Um, Certainly the local government in Wuhan sort of mismanaged the outbreak in the initial few weeks and you've, you've got these sort of very well-known doctors who tried to blow the whistle and, and they were silenced and there was sort of definitely some bungling uh, there. I mean, more recently, China probably has done quite a good job managing the outbreak. I mean, it really does seem to have it under control here. It, it can take some very heavy-handed measures uh, that, it, that other countries couldn't do. So I think there's an, an acceptance. It's done a good job managing the outbreak. The problem's been that um, um, the Chinese Communist Party and the sort of propaganda um, outlets have sort of been pushing this line that other other countries are, are really screwing it up and China's done a great job and, and the United States has really messed it up. And, and they've never said this officially, but some of their diplomats have sort of insinuated that the virus might not have come from China and it might have been brought into Wuhan by the US Army. Um, the United States is just as bad. I mean, there's all these crazy conspiracies flying around about you know the fact that the virus was man-made, et cetera. So there's a lot of misinformation out there and you could sort of say both governments are equally guilty of, of spreading it. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna actually, I, I wanna ask you, sorry, Mike, I wanted to actually ask you about that conspiracy theory. Um, 
uh, and I actually think it was the, the foreign minister spokesman floated this in a press conference. Uh, so it is, it, it does smack of being semi-official, um, or musings, but he did put it out there and now it has legs and we're here talking about it. I think you, you mentioned in a, in a, uh, in the social media post that um, you were at a dinner and things got pretty hot because people you you thought should have known better um, were actually given given this conspiracy theory a bit of credence. Uh, it, it's actually it's actually taken on a life of its own. Can you talk to that and why? People who should know better, educated cosmopolitan people who hang out with foreign journalists, kind of give this uh, a, so the benefit of the doubt at least. Yeah, and that's the problem because China unofficially sort of sanctions the spreading of these conspiracy theories, whether it's sort of on social media posts in China or, or whether it's one of its diplomats saying something on Twitter. So it's not it's not officially backing this theory, but it allow it does allow it to happen when it could certainly stop it. And and this sort of thinking is now I mean, I think it's pretty widespread amongst ordinary people in China. You talk to sort of your local security guard or someone in a shop and and many people sort of seem to believe it did come from the United States. Um, and I did, I went to this dinner recently with a sort of big group of friends, a mix of sort of Western expats and, and Chinese um, sort of well, very well-educated middle-class Chinese people and there was a guy at my table who I hadn't actually met before and I was just talking about Wuhan to a friend and and I don't know what I said in my conversation but he got deeply offended and suddenly took me to task and he said well the virus didn't come from Wuhan the outbreak didn't start you know we all know it came from the US Army etc etc and I was taken back because he, he you know he'd lived for years in the United States and seemed pretty switch on and I said do you really believe this and and he said he did and then and um, we talked about the diplomat that was spreading this rumor, and he told me it was good that China's diplomats could say what they what they thought, which is obviously complete rubbish because everything they say is sort of sanctioned from the top. Um, so there is this sort of widespread belief now, and it's become a bit of a sensitive issue. I mean, I do have Chinese friends here that I I sort of don't bring up the subject anymore because it just makes the situation a little bit too tense. But having said that, it's, I think it's from what I see on television, it's just as bad in the States. You've got all these, you know, you've got a few Republicans spreading conspiracy theories as well. And, and a lot of people over there and even in Australia seem to believe that China somehow intentionally unleashed this virus on the world. And all these statements are very dangerous because well, they're, they're I'm pretty sure they're not true and it's just inciting sort of racial hatred and, um, and you know, causing a lot of diplomatic tension between these two countries when, when we all should be working together. Um, I remember in our last chat, I asked you a question and I've, I've, I really regret it now, um, whether this is going to undermine uh, Xi Jinping's authority. Um, that he had a bad year last year, and to top it all off, he had a he had <laughs> the pandemic, and my goodness, uh, his 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 hold on power must seem tenuous now. Uh, wow, how things changed! Um, <laughs> if and I can't help but think, yeah, um, I can't help but think that um, he was given a massive assist by the United States. And ironically, the people he blames for it, uh, the handling by uh, by Donald Trump and perhaps even the Australian government by boxing him in and, make, and making making the Chinese people seem like villains, just handing it back to them as a as a propaganda cudgel. Yeah, well, that, that's the irony now. I mean, back in in February, early March, you could say this was a potential threat to the Chinese leadership, and people were talking about the Chernobyl moment that brought down the Communist Party in Russia, although most most people, even then at the time, they seemed to think she would certainly hang on for another term. But it feels like it's all flipped the other way now. I mean, the, the way um, the presidents and, and the party are managing this narrative is, is one of sort of this huge victory. Um, they've overcome this virus and then, and then the rest of the world's really struggling. So China's got this sort of advantage now. It's coming out of this two or three months ahead of everyone else. So it's going to be quite, um, it's, it's 
going to be hurting economically, but compared to everyone else, it's, it's got an advantage. Um, so it really could work in his favour. And we're sort of waiting for the next big political event here is the, the two sessions and, you know, the annual meeting of the National People's Congress, which was delayed in March. So we sort of think there's rumours uh, they're getting ready to hold that in May and that'll be an important political platform for the president to give a big speech about victory um, and outline some targets for the rest of the year. But having said that, there, there are still challenges. There's a lot of concern here about rising unemployment and obviously the economy's um, going backwards for the first time in 40 years. So it's not going to be an easy ride, but um, compared to Donald Trump and, um, and some other countries, they're, they're looking okay. <laughs> um, the pact that um, the Chinese Communist Party had with the people is said to be, um, you just put your faith in us and we'll del deliver you growth. And when, when the growth doesn't come, they sort of ramp up the, the, the propaganda. Do, do, you pay, do you pay that much heed? Is, is that something that, that you think holds water? And if so, I mean, get more propaganda to come, right? Sorry. Yeah. Well, I think, and we're already seeing it, we're sort of seeing this uptick in author authoritarianism and, and the propaganda's really ramping up a notch. And um, the economy is the government's biggest challenge. I mean, people here are, for two decades now, they've just been used to sort of this enormous growth and this sort of an assumption that everyone's lives are going to be better than their parents. So um, many people, many of the middle classes, haven't known financial hardship. So the big threat is if there's suddenly a big spike in unemployment, could that cause a problem uh, for the party? I can't see any sign of it now. I mean, I'm only in Shanghai, but but um, people seem um, reasonably satisfied. But, but people are struggling more than they would before. So the government's got to really stay on top of this. And there is sort of talk of big stimulus and they'll sort of do whatever it takes to keep the economy stable and to keep everyone sort of reasonably happy. It, I mean, the whole point of having foreign, cor foreign correspondents in China is to add to the reporting because you can't really rely too much on domestic media. And that just adds to the opacity of, of, of the country. And I just want to ask you, Mike, can you do your job? Can you, are you being followed? Do you, will people talk to you? Can you travel? I mean, can't, yeah, can you do your job? Yeah, well, it's getting much harder to do my job than it, was before. So, I mean, I've only really been here two and a half years. So there's journalists who have been here decades and they all tell me it has never been this difficult. It's getting tougher and tougher. Um, I mean, it's easier. Surveillance is much easier with electronic technology. But I mean, I've found the biggest obstacle is the, the willingness of people to speak to you. And I've even noticed it in two years. Two years ago, people, people businesses and companies and traders would certainly be happy to speak to you about the economy and how that was going. But even now there, many of them are too scared. And, and just this incident yesterday highlighted the, you know, this real wariness about speaking to foreign journalists. So it sort of feels like you're coming to a point where no one will speak to you on the ground. And that makes it sort of almost obsolete to be here. It's not, it's not quite at that level yet. You can still get out and about and, and chat to lots of people, but, um, it is getting much harder. And as you know, um, there were sort of 13 very well-regarded American journalists who have been expelled from China in the last month or so. And that's left a huge hole in the foreign media coverage in China. These were probably the best journalists reporting on China. They all spoke Mandarin. They had really deep knowledge of how the country worked. So that's a huge loss for the rest of the world. And some argue it's a huge loss for China because they, they actually do understand China and they care about the country, they're not always going to spout the Communist Party line, but um, they often provide quite balanced reporting um, compared to a lot of the very hawkish stories about China that are coming out of sort of news desks in, in Sydney or London or Washington. Well, in the meantime, we still have Mike Smith. <laughs> Mike, thanks so much for joining me and uh, keep it up, mate. Stay safe in Jakarta.
Two months after the first cases of the coronavirus emerged in the Jakarta satellite town of Depok to the south, the capital appears to be avoiding the worst of the pandemic. Infections may be several times the official tally of 12,000, which it reached this week. Even so, they are far lower than many had feared. But my next guest, Dr. Pandu Riono, says that while infections are slowing in Jakarta, they are rising in its bedroom communities, which are home to its office workers, its housekeepers, and its restaurant staff. Dr. Pandu, who is an infectious diseases expert with the University of Indonesia, says for that reason, the city's lockdown should remain. He poured cold water on unsubstantiated theories. They include whether heat and humidity and common injections, like the Bacillus Kalmet-Giran vaccine for tuberculosis, could slow the spread of the coronavirus. Dr. Pandu joined me from his home in Jakarta. I wanted to ask about the differing infection rates. Uh, Malaysia has just over 6,000. Uh, Indonesia has double that in terms of infections, and the United States is uh, well over a million now. How do you account for how some countries are getting hurt or hit worse than others? Yeah, I think the, the number is also influenced by the number of testing, because the, num the more we uh, increasing the testing for the people, we will get uh, new infections in the community. The problem in Indonesia is the problem of our testing capacity is very limited. That's why our number of infected COVID is not high as in the other area. When we increasing the capacity and we will get more uh, increasing number of cases itself, it means that this is depend on the only uh, testing uh, capacity. The the latest figures uh, from the government suggest just under 12,000 infections. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and expand okay. testing throughout the population, what do you think you might find? Where do you? Th what is your best guess of the number of infections right now? Yeah, we estimate is around 30% and 40% that currently detected. It means that uh, we will get three times higher that, uh, or two times higher that, that we detected in our system. It means that our system is still under detections. So that's roughly what, 30 or 40,000 infections, you would say? Yes, of course, that, that's three until, uh, I mean, uh, between two until three, or two until four, if you want the uh, wild guessing. That seems to me as if Indonesia is maybe avoiding some of the worst case scenarios that were being uh, bandied about a couple months ago. I think I saw one model out of uh, the Brookings Institute that suggested that potentially it could have 600,000 deaths in the first year, even in a, in a mild scenario. Yeah, that's also influenced, the death is influenced uh, our testing capacity. Do you know that uh, currently WSO already revising the, uh, the definitions of the death not only confirmed by laboratory diagnostic, but also the people who already uh, treated as uh, COVID suspect, it should be uh, uh, said it, uh, if they are dead, we should be uh, dead caused by COVID because uh, our testing capacity is very limited. Most of the dead and also the cases is influenced by our testing capacity. That's why the reported death is slower than we expected because of the uh, the governments not reported, the people not have a laboratory confirmations. What is causing the bottlenecks in testing? 
the bottleneck is because in in the start of the epidemic we only one reference laboratory at Minister of Health and when the increasing people with uh, suspect is uh, the system the only one referral laboratory is not enough to dealing with this uh, number of people that's why and then they still increasing the capacity within the Ministry of Health Laboratory in in some province but in some province itself is not yet ready and actually they forgot that many university has laboratory uh, PCR laboratory that that's why uh, after uh, some time uh, the government realized that they should also involve capacity laboratory from university in some area. It means that even that uh, we have some problem with the supply, supply, logistic supply for reagents. When we increasing the laboratory capacity, including the laboratory in university in in Surabaya, in Medan, in Padang, Bandung, in Jawa Tengah, uh, in, in Makassar, and then uh, uh, all the some time is uh, maybe in the last two weeks is uh, they run out the reagent for extractions, the specimen. That's why, and that's why we have still have no problem even we increasing the uh, laboratory and the problem uh, dealing with the supply logistic for reagent. So the infrastructure is still a work in progress. I think you you uh, listed off six or seven cities there all across the the country. Fair, fine enough having the laboratories, but you still need the equipment and the chemicals right to to it's, test it's right. And and so we're still. We're still trying to make up for that. Is that, is that correct? Can you can yes, you yes. can you explain the role of these reagents? Where do they come from? What do they do? We imported from abroad the death extracts uh, for the specimen. The specimen we dealing the using chemical the extract for the uh, RNA uh, molecular uh, genetics from the virus, and then. After the extract, we will examine using PCR. We amplify using PCR to detect uh, they have virus or not. And is Indonesia struggling to get these reagents? Yeah, uh, for some time it's very difficult because every country in the world is also needed for this chemical. So presumably it's a problem that everyone's having. Yes, uh, but but most of the country they already have some logistic uh, for reagents. That's the problem. Is Indonesia we don't have logistic that we prepare for the big uh, capacity to increasing because we increasing suddenly the capacity and the machine is there, but the reagent is not enough to fill in all the to fill in all the machine. I'm kind of imagining it like um, printing machines, and you need the uh, ink cartridges, and so you can you can have all the all the uh, right. You can have all the print printing machines and scanning machines in the world, but unless you've got the ink cartridges, it doesn't work, right? Yeah, that's true. That's uh, the good analog that we have problem with ink cartridges. All right. Well, I'm um. I'm scanning the horizon for a little bit of good news, and I think I found it. It looks like the burials in Jakarta for people who are, for, for patients or victims who were suspected of having COVID-19 has actually fallen dramatically throughout the month last month. Um, there's also been a, uh, a tick down in the number of infections Little bit of good news there in in Jakarta, which which has been the epicenter of the of the epidemic in Indonesia so far. Things going the right way, at least. I think so uh, because uh, when we examine the uh, the effect of uh, social uh, distancing approach, large massive social distancing approach is 
uh, we can see from the data that we examine from mobility data from Google in Jakarta, in every province, and we can uh, have the data based on the people who using the Android uh, handphones. And uh, surprising that in Jakarta, the people who stay at home is become increasing until 60%. When they more than 50% and we are look at the reporting for the cases, is become horizontal and then when we are increasing until 60% and then going going down. Hopefully in the next week and we will increasing the we can see the increasing people or they still maintaining the 60% or increasing until 70% and the, the reporting of the cases will be uh, more going down and then uh, we can risk uh, very few cases uh, in the next two weeks. So the mobile data coming from Google suggests that 60% six, of mobile phone users are more or less staying put. They're staying uh, presumably at home. Yes, yeah, stay at home, at home. Is that enough, 60% enough? Uh, not enough, but you know that when we uh, currently, we are monitoring the admission hospital also uh, is going down. You know, the people who have suspect to go to hospital in, in Jakarta is incre uh, now become less. Uh, I mean that not like uh, last month, you know, that it may be is consistent with the cases reported and also the, the admission in hospital and the burial is also going down, it means that all the data is tend to show the same result. What, in your view, is the right way then to consider lifting the restrictions? What would you like to see in terms of data before you do that? And if it were up to you, how would you go about doing it? Yeah, it, it means that I'm not suggest for lifting the restriction because this happened only in Jakarta. But when we see the data from outside Jakarta, like Depok, Bekasi, the the supporting uh, region from Jakarta is still not uh, follow the Jakarta because they. Uh, uh, started uh, late for the social distancing approach. It's been that we cannot leave the resistance in Jakarta if the another area surrounding Jakarta still problem with the increasing cases. So it's like uh, it's a proverbial balloon. It's squeezing. Yeah, that's true. Right. There will be more bubble in the outside, you know. Like balloon, you know, uh, they will go up from another side when you uh, press in the middle. I, I wonder if you could help me do a little bit of myth busting now. Can, can you help me bust some myths? Myths to do with the coronavirus. So we're going to do a true, true or false lightning round. The, um, okay. yeah, the, the tuberculosis um, vaccine, the BCG vaccine, true or false? Is it effective? Does it confer immunity to, to coronavirus? False. 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 Can you, uh, for, for extra points, can you pronounce the full name of BCG? Uh, BCG, the full name? Yeah. Basil Calmet Gullib in Affection. I forgot the G. I think it's. But that's. Gourin. It's French. Gourin. Gourin. French. Yeah. yeah. Gourin. Okay, well, the judges have accepted that one. Um, humidity and light, they're effective to, they're effective uh, means of mitigating the spread of, of the coronavirus. True or false? False. Really? Yes. Okay, <laughs> all right. So it won't magically go away in summer up, up in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, true or false, COVID-19, uh, sort of the uh, SARS-CoV-2, the, virus start, that, that causes uh, COVID-19 was started in a bioweapons lab. False. 
It would be one of the. It would be a really stupid bioweapon, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it's deadly, enough. but not deadly enough. <laughs> just just enough to be annoying. Yes. Um, sir, I want to I, I want to thank you very much for, for joining me. One last question: One year from now, paint me a picture. What does what does the world look like? Or will we be out of this? Uh, we'll be we'll be have a new different world. It'd be a different world. Would it be a nice world? Uh, not really, until maybe more than two years, uh, will be like a very strange word. We cannot, uh, we will using masks when we go out, you know, and then we cannot uh, have some gathering together uh, without masks, you know. <laughs> it's very strange, you know. It's not like before. Thank you, Professor. On that note, I'm going to let you go. All the best. Stay healthy. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. And that's the program. Thanks to Mike Smith and Dr. Pandariono for joining me. Thanks also to Stephen Handoko, our producer, and Imam Shofwan for research and reporting. For On the Level, I'm Jeff Hutton. If you like the show, rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll be back next week. Bye for now.